got one conflict of interest I want to declare. Um, among other things, I'm going to present the results um, of the so-called neurosis study. Neurosis is an acronym. It stands for the Neonatal European Study of Inhaled Steroids. And this study was mainly funded by the European Union in its seventh framework program, but it was also partially funded by a pharmaceutical company that was not otherwise involved in any aspects of the study. So, um, you may have recognized that the title of my presentation is Early Corticosteroids for the Prevention of BPD. So, the first question I ask myself and I want to answer in this presentation, um, what is BPD? So, um, to be more precise, what do the three letters BPD actually stand for? So, I did what everybody does these days. I went to the internet and I typed into Google the three letters BPD. And here's what I found. So, there are lots of different definitions for the three letters BPD. So, as you can see, it starts with borderline personality disorder. It continues with bipolar disorder. There are also some interesting things. Um, for example, here is the beach party division. Um, but you already know I'm not going to talk about the beach party. I'll talk about corticosteroids um, for the prevention of bronchopulmonary <coughs> dysplasia. So now at least you know what the three letters stand for, but you still don't know what bronchopulmonary dysplasia is. And that's a much more complicated question to answer. We could discuss for hours, days, weeks. Um, some international committees right at the moment even take years to find new definitions for um, BPD, and there are many reasons for that. And one of the reasons is that the picture of BPD has changed over the recent mm -hmm. years. When it was um, first described um, in 1967 um, by William Northway in his landmark publication in the New England Journal of Medicine called Pulmonary Disease Following Respirator Therapy of Highly Membrane Disease, Northway described the type of BPD you don't see anymore on your units because what Northway described um, was a type um, that we now call the old BPD and which is more or less gone. So Northway described this um, type of BPD, the old BPD, which was mainly caused by a structural injury quite late in lung development during the so-called alveolar stage, which starts around 32 weeks um, gestation. What we see on our units these days is a completely different type of BPD. It has been coined the new BPD, and it's now more or less caused by a developmental arrest or a developmental delay in lung development, much earlier in the so-called secular stage, which starts around 23 weeks of gestation. But what is um, very important, for my presentation at least, is the fact that both types of BPD have something in common, and that is the fact that inflammation plays a very important role in both types of BPD. Because we know inflammation can not only contribute to lung fibrosis and thus to the old BPD, but it can also um, contribute to um, lung arrest uh, or a, a stop in development of the lungs. And if we now know that inflammation plays an important role in the pathogenesis of BPD and we want to treat that disease or find something for treatment or prevention, it doesn't take a long time till we will consider corticosteroids. And why is that? As you all know, corticosteroids have a variety of anti-inflammatory properties. Some of them you see here on this slide. So we know they interact with structural cells like epithelial cells or endothelial cells, but also directly with inflammatory cells and also with some mediators of inflammation. So potentially they are useful. If we now want to use them on our units, in our departments, 
we basically have three different modes of administering corticosteroids. We can either give them systemically, like directly into the blood, we can give them by inhalation, or we can give them um, as a mixture together with surfactant directly into the trachea. It's called the topical administration. And if we consider potentially time points when we can give it, we can either give it early as a prophylactic approach, or we can give it later as a treatment approach. Although I have to say that this distinction is quite arbitrary. So what I'm going to focus on in my presentation, because I'll talk about prophylaxis and prevention of BPD, I'll focus on the early administration and I'll talk about all three modes of administration of corticosteroids. So let's start with early systemic corticosteroids. What substances do we have available for our babies? We basically have three different substances. Dexamethasone, it's the best studied um, drug we have. It has an exclusive glucocorticoid effect. Then we have hydrocortisone. It has an almost equal glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid um, effect. And then we have betamethasone, which basically is a stereoisomer of dexamethasone. So let's focus on dexamethasone first. And what I want to present you now is the clinical evidence, like the clinical study results, the results from systematic reviews about early dexamethasone for the prevention of BPD. So what I will do in, in all of my um, studies that I include in this presentation, I'll just talk about the tip of the pyramid of the evidence to have the highest level of evidence to support my conclusions. So dexamethasone, early dexamethasone, what do we know about it? There's a systematic review from the Cochrane collaboration, which has been updated in 2017. It's on the early administration of systemic steroids. The outcome I'm presenting here is BPD at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. And here is the result of the subgroup only for dexamethasone. So what can you see? There are lots of studies included in this meta-analysis. It's 14 studies. We've got more than 1,800 patients included in this meta-analysis. And if you look at the graph, for some reason, the vertical line, um, which indicates a risk ratio of one, is missing. Um, so you can't really see whether this is a significant result or not. But if you look at the confidence interval, you can see there is um, the one is not included. It ranges from 0 0.64 to 0 0.83. And if one is not included, that means that's a statistically significant finding. So we can conclude from this um, presentation that early dexamethasone reduces BPD at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, and the effect is quite large. What about side effects? If we look at the same um, systematic review, we now have changed the outcome to death or cerebral palsy. You can see there are less studies included. We're now talking about um, well, around 900 patients. Um, we can't see that the diamond moved to the other side, but if we look at the confidence interval and the risk ratio, it's just at the border of significance, but it's on the other side of the risk ratio. So we conclude from this presentation that early dexamethasone increases the risk of death or cerebral palsy. So there are serious side effects to early dexamethasone. What about hydrocortisone? Again, from the same Cochrane review, the outcome is now as two slides before, BPD at 36 weeks. We can see less studies are included. A bit more than 1,000 patients, no statistically significant result. If you want to use the word, there may be a trend towards a reduction of BPD, but it's not yet statistically significant. But it looks promising. Again, what about side effects of hydrocortisone? 
Here we see the outcome major neurosensory disability. And as you can see, no, no hint in the data, like no significant result. So other than dexamethasone, early hydrocortisone doesn't seem to have any major serious side effects. But the effect on BPD is not yet significant. So that's why the authors of this Cochrane review concluded that the benefits of the early postnatal steroid treatment, and they define early as less than seven days of age, particularly dexamethasone, may not outweigh adverse effects associate, associated with this um, treatment. So that's one way to look at the data, but I personally think it makes sense to have another perspective on the available clinical study data. And for this perspective, for this new perspective, it's important to keep one thing in mind, and this is the fact that BPD itself is a very strong risk factor for later neurosensory developmental impairment. It has been shown in many studies. I brought you one study. It's a study by Barbara Schmidt that has been published in JAMA uh, more, than, uh, yeah, more than 10 years ago. And in this study, Barbara Schmidt and colleagues clearly showed that BPD itself increases the odds by the factor of 2.4 of neurosensory delay with two years of age. It's an effect that is highly statistically significant. So keep in mind, BPD itself is a risk factor for neurodevelopmental delay later on in life. And if we keep that in mind, and we now look again at the available study data, um, we can have the following perspective. This is a bit of a complicated figure. It was published by Lex Doyle um, from Melbourne um, a few years ago, but I'll walk you through it. So what um, this graph shows on the x-axis is the risk of BPD. So here you have babies with a very low risk of developing BPD, like probably your 32 or 33 weaker. And here on this side, you have the babies with a very high risk of developing BPD, like your 24, 25 weaker. And speaking in terms of studies, on the x-axis you have your risk of BPD in the control group of the studies. On the y-axis, you have the effect on the composite outcome on death or cerebral palsy. You've got this dotted line, this dotted horizontal line here, um, at zero, which means there's no effect on death or cerebral palsy. And then you've got all those circles in the graph. And all those circles are all the studies that have, like all the randomized control studies, that have been conducted. The larger the circle, the more infants were included. The smaller the circle, the less infants were included. And what you can see now is if you look at the studies, for example, this study with a very low risk of BPD, you do harm with giving systemic steroids because this study favors the control group in the study, the placebo group, so you do harm on the effect of death or CP. But if you look, for example, at those studies where infants with a very high risk of developing BPD are included, you can actually, doing, you can actually do them a favor by um, giving um, corticosteroids because you reduce the composite effect of death or CP. So the take-home message from this graph is that if you consider systemic corticosteroids for BPD, you should only consider it in infants that, that have a very high risk of developing BPD. How do we know which infants do have a very high risk? Well, you can look at individual publications. You, just to give you one number, like 28 weeks and below have a rough risk of 35% developing um, BPD. And there are many tools available. For example, there's an online calculator from um, the United States where you can put in some numbers like gestational age, 
um, sex and so on, and then the calculator tells you the risk of that individual baby to get um, BPD. Some words of caution, this is done in an American um, population, um, which is not completely comparable, I guess, to, to your population or the European population. Like if you compare the American with the European population, they generally have a little bit of higher risk of BPD. But it helps you to get an idea um, about your individual baby. So that's all I want to say about um, systemic corticosteroids. I now want to talk about the early administration of inhaled corticosteroids for the prevention of BPD. So why, why do we even consider giving steroids by inhalation? Well, in theory, it could well be that there's a beneficial effect directly on the pulmonary system because we give it by inhalation and there may be less systemic negative side effects. But that's the theory. And again, we need to have a look at the clinical study data. But before we do that, again, we look at the substances that we have available. There's the so-called um, group of the old inhaled corticosteroids like budesonide and biclomethasone. And then there's some newer substances like the fluticasone. Um, but the best studied um, substance by far is budesonide. So I'm going to concentrate of inhaled budesonide for the prevention of BPD. So here are the three main questions that I want to answer in the next 10 minutes. So what did we know about inhaled budesonide for the prevention of BPD until 2014? Second question, what did or maybe still do practice based on these available study results? And then I want to present what do we know since 2015. So what did we know until 2014? Well, until 2014, there were, excuse me, there were three studies available. Study by Arnon from 1996, study from Mertz from 1999, and a study from Johnson from the year 2000. So Arnon, they randomized 20 patients to either budesonide or placebo. Their primary outcome was failed extubation by seven days of life. They didn't find a statistically significant result, and there's no information about the long-term outcome available whatsoever. The next study by Mertz, only 23 infants, again, comparison of budesonide versus placebo, another primary outcome, the duration of ventilation, again, no statistically significant difference, and again, no information about the long-term outcomes. The third study, Johnson, 30 infants, budesonide versus placebo. Again, another primary outcome reduction, FL2, after 14 days. No significant difference, no information about long-term outcome. So that's a bit um, disappointing. Like, until 2014, there were only 73, inf 73 infants that have ever been randomized to inhaled budesonide or control group. None of the three studies found a significant effect, and none of the studies followed the infants up until they reached an age of one, two, three um, years. So what did we do based on this very limited evidence? One would assume that with this very limited information available, us, we, neonatologists, would not use inhaled corticosteroids for the prevention or treatment of BPD. So the question is, is this true? Did we not use them? Did we use them? And I brought you three studies to show you that we actually did something which I didn't expect. All over the world, we used them quite heavily. I'm not sure what you do in Ukraine, so I'm interested. Like, who of you would use inhaled corticosteroids for prevention or treatment of BPD? I see no hands up, so you are the exception because Asia, North America, and Europe do it differently, which I'm going to show you here. 
So what did we practice? First study out of Europe, it's a survey out of Germany that was published in 2010. It includes all pediatric hospitals with a neonatal unit. It includes preterm infants, and according to this survey, 46% of the pediatric hospitals administered inhaled corticosteroids, either as a prophylaxis or treatment for BPD. So obviously, despite very limited evidence, people in Germany used it. And what did they use? Sorry, um, no, just going to the next continent, now crossing the Atlantic Ocean, have a look at the United States. So there's a retrospective cohort study published in 2014. It includes neonatal units of 35 US children's hospital, roughly more than 1,400 with evolving BPD, and according to this study, inhaled corticosteroids were prescribed to 25% of the cohort. And if you look at the substances, the drugs that were used, you can see that um, biclomethasone and budesonide were the most popular um, drugs. Now, going to the third continent, going to Asia, um, there's a study published out of um, Japan, um, which includes all tertiary neonatal units in Japan, includes preterm infants, and in this study there is something special because they distinguished between steroids that were given for the prophylaxis, which means early, and steroids that were given quite late for the treatment of established BPD. So here is what this study found. On the left side, you see early inhaled corticosteroids. On the right side, panel B, you see um, late inhaled corticosteroids. So here's steroids inhaled, user rate around 70%, so quite a high rate. And if we look at panel B, treatment, inhaled steroids go down to the x-axis. It's something between 60 or 70%. So at least in Japan, apparently, they were quite popular, same in the United States and same in Germany. And keep in mind, there were not even 80 infants that were randomized to inhaled bodesonide. So what do we know now? Has the picture changed? Um, of course it has changed, um, because um, based on this very limited evidence, we launched a quite large randomized controlled trial um, around 10 years ago. That's the neonatal European study of inhaled um, steroids. You can see that there were nine countries included um, in Europe plus um, Israel. And in short, what we did is we randomized 863 preterm infants to either budesonide or placebo. Our primary outcome was death or BPD with 36 weeks postmenstrual age. And we also published the long-term outcome data um, earlier this year, which I'm going to show you. Um, but here are more details on the neurosis study. Um, so the main study question we asked in this study is the following. In infants born at 2307 to 27 to 67 weeks, does inhaled budesonide compared with placebo decrease the risk of death or BPD at 36 weeks postmenstrual age? So that's the main study question. We included infants less than 28 weeks of gestation they needed to have a postnatal age of less than 12 hours because we wanted to have a look at the prophylactic approach, and they needed to require any form of positive pressure support. We excluded infants that were not considered viable by the attending physicians or had major congenital anomalies. As I already said, primary outcome is a composite of death or BPD at 36 weeks, and we use the so-called physiological definition of um, BPD. Here's the dose we used. It's quite a high dose. So in the first 14 days of life, the infants received two times two puffs out of a metered dose inhaler, and one puff was the equivalent of 200 micrograms budesonide or placebo. And following day 14, from day 15 until the end of the study, they received 400 micrograms, which is equal to two pints, one puff um, per day. We discontinued the study drug 
if there was no more oxygen requirement or positive pressure support or the infants received, uh, reached 32 weeks postmenstrual age regardless of their ventilator status. Briefly, sample site calculation, we anticipated a rate of BPD around 35% and death of 15, which makes up for 50%. Study had 80% power. We aimed for a relative reduction of 20% in the primary outcome, and with a two-tailed type 1 error rate, we calculated a sample size of 850 infants. The study was um, well concealed against bias. It's always important if you look at randomized or at every study, but especially randomized controlled trials, that you look at issues like blinding, allocation concealment, rate of follow-up, and so on. So if you look at the random sequence generation, was well done by computer, allocation was concealed, um, all participants and outcome assessors were blinded, and we had a complete follow-up for the primary outcome. So here's um, what we found. It was published in 2000. Um, 15. Here's the primary composite outcome. So in the budesonide group, 40% of our patients were either dead or suffered from BPD compared to 46% of the patients in the placebo group. Relative risk of 0.86, just on the border of statistical significance. And if we look at the individual components of this composite, Here's BPD, here's death. You can see that BPD was reduced by 10%, 38 to 27.8%, highly statistically significant. But if you look at mortality, there's obviously no significant difference, but in absolute numbers, mortality was higher in the budesonide group. We had 16.9% in the budesonide group compared to 13.6% percent in the placebo group. So that's a bit worrisome. And um, just earlier this year, in 2018, we published the long-term follow-up um, results of this study. And the study included just one long-term pre-specified secondary outcome, which again was a composite outcome of four individual components. And the components were cerebral palsy, blindness, hearing loss, or cognitive delay. And the cognitive delay was defined, as we heard previously from Neil, with the um, Bailey 2 scales MDI of 85. If we look at the results, no difference between the two groups, which is encouraging. Also, if we look at the individual components, no difference between the two groups. But because we were worried about our primary outcome findings with the increased mortality, we post hoc defined exploratory analysis that now include mortality at two years of age. So the first one is death or disability. Again, disability was defined in the same way. If you look at the numbers, 59 versus 59 percent, no difference between the two groups. But if you look at mortality alone, there's still a difference which now reached a significance. So that's still worrisome. We looked at various explanations. We looked at um, reasons for death on autopsy reports, death certificates, and so on. And there's no good explanation that could explain that difference. So it may well be a chance finding because we didn't adjust for multiple testing. We tested in the same population, so it may be chance but we can't be entirely sure about it. So what do we do? Well, what we usually do in such a situation is we pool the data from all available studies into a meta-analysis. And this has been done um, in various systematic reviews and meta-analysis. I brought three of them with me. The first one is the updated Cochrane review from 2017, which is now including the neurosis trial. And you see the composite death or BPD. You see BPD and death. Look at the p-values, a significant reduction of the composite, obviously a significant reduction of BPD, and no effect on mortality if you pool all the data. Second systematic review 
from Eric Shinwell, they didn't distinguish between early and late steroids, so they just pooled all the studies that used inhaled corticosteroids, 16 studies, and if you look at the numbers, they're quite impressively the same, reduction of the composite, reduction of BPD, no effect on mortality, and this study was updated just recently and includes a larger study from Japan, which is not yet included in this and in this meta-analysis, so now we have 17 studies, and look at the numbers, they're more or less the same, so there doesn't seem to be a real effect on mortality, at least according to those systematic reviews. So we may use inhaled corticosteroids for the prevention of BPD, but I can tell you in my unit, we don't use it regularly. We use it in babies with a very high risk, but not in every infant below 28 weeks because of the unanswered question about mortality. So finally, what about topical administration of corticosteroids? Again, topical is a mixture of steroids and surfactant. Why do we even consider this approach? Again, the direct intratracheal installation may facilitate the delivery of the corticosteroid to the lungs, especially to the periphery of the lungs, because that's where surfactant gets to, and by this we may also have less systemic um, side effects. What do we know about the combination of both? There are two RCTs that have been published until now. One is a pilot study. It's actually, they are both from the same group out of um, Taiwan. The first one is a pilot study that included 116 infants. They compared a mixture of Seventa and Budesonide to Seventa alone. Primary outcome was the same, BPD and death. And then they followed this pilot study with a larger study. It's a study that includes three study centers, two in Taiwan, and I believe it was um, Chicago that was also included. 260 infants, same comparison, same outcome. So what did they find? Here you have the pilot study and the uh, multi-center study outcome BPD. You can see with one view, clear reduction, significant reduction of BPD, and the studies are quite homogeneous. If you look at the composite, death or BPD, the picture is more or less the same, but the total number of infants that have been evaluated is still quite small. It's not even 400 infants, but according to these data, this looks really promising. What about long-term outcomes? They published um, some long-term outcomes, not all of them. So here's what they published, death by two years, death or moderate severe neurodevelopmental delay at two years, moderate to severe delay in survivors, and survival without moderate um, neurodevelopmental delay at two years. Just look at the confidence intervals. One is included in every of those four confidence intervals. So obviously no side effects on the long-term outcomes when the infants reach two years. But again, the numbers of the infants that were included in these analyses are quite low. But this may be a very promising approach. It may well be the so-called magic bullet, but I personally think we still have to wait till we got more data on this approach. So in summary, I conclude um, that despite the fact that you in, in Ukraine don't use inhaled corticosteroids, there seem to be many countries in the world that really use corticosteroids a lot for the prevention and treatment of BPD. I've shown you that BPD itself is a very strong risk factor for later death or neurosensory impairment. My personal view is that if you use systemic steroids, you should clearly restrict it to infants with a very high risk of BPD. I've shown you the neurosis study that found the difference in the primary composite outcome of BPD or death of borderline statistical significance. There was no difference in the pre-specified long-term composite outcome 
but in that post hoc analysis we did, we found that mortality was higher in the budesonide group, but meta analysis suggests that this effect may not really be true and there may be no relevant side effects. And lastly, I've shown you the two RCTs out of Taiwan that suggest the beneficial effect of budesonide and surfactant as a mixture. But my personal view is there's not enough evidence yet to support this as a routine approach. Um, it may prove to be beneficial in the future, and I think regardless of what kind of administration we choose, for every study looking at corticosteroids in preterm infants, there definitely should be a long-term um, follow-up. So, Lastly, I want to thank a few people, all the children and families that um, participated in the neurosis study, the people that worked at a coordinating center, the data monitoring committee, all the investigators and staff. Without them, it wouldn't have been possible. And lastly, our funders, especially the European Union. I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Could you specify for us a couple of clinical aspects? What actually is the indication, the true indication for uh, prevention of BPD? Is that the gestation age or ventilation type or maybe the oxygen uh, percentage or how long is the child on ventilation? What should be the choice? Uh, whether we uh, choose for systemic or we uh, go for butesonide uh, uh, inhaled? What should be the choice? So, uh, the first question was, um, when should we use steroids for the prevention of BPD? How do we define the population that probably would benefit um, from a preventive approach? Very good question, very difficult question. I think um, it all depends on the baseline risk of the infant of developing BPD. Um, one thing I haven't really explicitly shown you, but in the graph um, where on the x-axis we had the baseline risk and on the y-axis we had the, the effect of corticosteroids, there was a regression line and that regression line had a 95% confidence interval around them. And if you look at the upper limit of that confidence interval, it crosses the null effect line or the zero effect line at around 60% risk. So based on this, I would say a preventive approach may be justified if you have at least a 60% risk of a baby developing BPD. And how do you find out which infants are uh, um, having such kind of risk? Again, there are tools or study data available. Um, so one thing I would encourage, have a look at the um, NICHD calculator on the web, try to play with it, and then you get an impression of the, the, um, the, the magnitude of risk um, of the infants developing um, BPD. The other question was, if, and please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, um, when would we consider systemic steroids in, in our unit? So I think everybody um, telling me in my unit we are not using systemic corticosteroids, probably not really saying the truth, because if we look at everything that has been published in the recent years, it confirms that all over the world systemic corticosteroids are still used, roughly in a rate between 20 and 30 percent for infants below 28 weeks. In my unit in, in CIRC, we use um, systemic steroids, um, we use dexamethasone, despite the fact that I've shown you it has um, serious side effects, but we definitely try to use it late and not early, so we don't use it within the first seven days of life, because there's data out there um, showing that there's still an effect on BPD if you use it late, but there are no serious um, or less serious um, neurosensory side effects. So we use it after day eight, especially after two weeks. That's when we kind of feel safe. And we use it in infants that we don't get off the ventilator, that have very high pressures and need a lot of oxygen. 
And for a rough estimate, I would probably say we use it in 10 to 15% of these infants on, on our unit. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. It's really brilliant. Tell me, please, will your decision be influenced by comorbidities in the form of sepsis or severe pneumonia in children? Whether this will influence your decision on making use of corticosteroids or no, will that be additional risk in your mind? Again, um, very good um, question. Um, as far as I know, there are no study data available that help me answering your question, so I can only go back to personal um, experience. So what we'll do in, in Zurich is, if we have a baby um, suffering from acute severe sepsis or acute pneumonia, um, we would probably attribute the clinical deterioration to that condition, like the sepsis and the pneumonia, and, and first try to treat this with antibiotics and so on, and wait a few days. Um, if it's not getting better and we see that, for example, the blood um, well used like CRP is going down, so we, s we don't think that it's sepsis anymore and the baby is still very bad, then we would use the systemic steroids. But we tr really try to avoid to give it right at the moment when there is acute sepsis and because we, we know, I've shown you, it has the um, anti-inflammatory um, effects as well. And most likely babies may get better after sepsis or pneumonia is getting better. Thank you very much for your presentations. I have very uh, little comments to your presentations. Uh, in this year, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't remember, in, uh, in January and February, uh, it was very interesting publications issued in the British Medical Journal. And uh, some author from China published an uh, investigation about BPD and some uh, topic questions that you raised in your, uh, in your presentations was highlighted in this issue. But uh, this uh, investigation's uh, outcome of these investigations uh, that authors point out um, it's very uh, interesting uh, about prescribing uh, uh, systemic uh, corticosteroids. When we need to start dexamethasone, uh, if we start it early, they mean uh, early seven, seven days. If uh, they prescri uh, prescribe seven, 14 days. Uh, in other questions, they prescribe more than 14 days. The first one. Uh, second one. Uh, the dose of dexamethasone, high dose, low dose. What do you mean uh, high dose? High dose, three milligram per kilo, or low dose, less than three milligram per kilo. And another uh, outcome of this investigation is very interesting, uh, 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 d d d durables of uh, treatments, shortness or f uh, f very long prescriptions. And these investigations is very, very, very nice delineate answer on, the, on these questions. The outcome, for this investigation, first of all, you need prescribe at seven to 14 days dexamethasone. After, you need to prescribe very high doses, three milligrams per kilo. But in my opinion, it's very, very, very high. And now in, in my personal skills, it's very dangerous. In my mind, I never changed my <laughs> old opinion about prescription for uh, high doses mm -hmm. and very short prescriptions. What do you say about this uh, outcome of this investigation? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for, for both questions. First question in regards to timing again. Um, so what is early, what is late? It's arbitrary. Like, as you said, some people would say the cutoff is seven days, 10 days, 14 days. Um, for example, the Cochrane cutoff um, changed from seven to 14 days. It's now 14 days, um, and there's another Cochrane review that looked at timing and dosing. So in my take on of the available evidence, what you can take home is the later you give it, the less side effects you have, and you most likely still see an effect on BPD. So um, my arbitrary cutoff is I would probably not use it before the, inf oh, af um, before the infant reaches 
two weeks of age. So I would use a cutoff of 14 days, unless in some very, very rare exceptions, but we would probably never use it before the infant reaches one week of life because on, um, of the side effects I've, I've just shown you. Second question was in regards um, to dosage. Again, many studies available, different meta-analysis, the most recent one from Onlen and colleagues from, from the Cochrane collaboration um, basically concludes there is no evidence available to support one approach or the other. Um, so what do we do in, in Zurich based on, on this very limited evidence? I agree with you that the cumulative dose of systemic steroids, especially dexamethasone, should probably be on the lower side. So what we do, we use the 10-day the DART regimen. That's the regimen from the, the DART study that has been conducted in Australia, which um, has a very low cumulative dose, but it spreads it out over um, 10 days. So that's, that's what we do. 